In this video, we will talk about motor disorders. And what I mean by disorders is disorders affecting somehow your skeletal muscles, your voluntary muscles. We'll be comparing upper motor neuron lesions to lower motor neuron lesions and what each of these mean. In order to understand upper and lower motor neuron lesions, we must recap the motor pathways, looking at the pyramidal system, which is a system of voluntary movement. Normal motor function depends on the transmission of signals from the brain to brainstem or spinal cord by the upper motor neurons, and then from there to skeletal muscles by lower motor neurons. Here is a cross-section of the primary motor cortex of the brain. The outer gray matter of the cortex have areas where neurons arise from, which are associated to a particular area in the body, so the feet, hands, and the face. The white matter consists mainly of neurons' axons, which travel through the brain. Motor neurons will pass through the internal capsule, situated near the thalamus and basal ganglia. Here is the brainstem, which is made up of three parts, the midbrain, the important area here is the red nucleus and crus cerebri, and the pons, not drawn, as well as the medulla oblongata here. Here is a cross-section of the spinal cord where the communication between upper and lower motor neurons occur. We will learn about this soon. The spinal cord have tracts, which are where neurons travel through. Important tracts in the pyramidal system are the lateral corticospinal tract and the anterior corticospinal tracts. The target organ of the motor neurons are the skeletal muscle cells. Let's create a scenario where we want to move our right thumb. The upper motor neurons arise from the left primary motor cortex, pass through the internal capsule, through the brainstem, passing the crus cerebri, passing through the pons, and then passing through the medulla, the area called the pyramids. Hence, it's called the pyramidal system. The vast majority of upper motor neurons that project from the motor cortex to the spinal cord are contained in the lateral corticospinal tract. The neurons that will travel through the lateral corticospinal tracts will cross over at the medulla of the brainstem. Once the upper motor neurons reaches the correct spinal level, it will synapse with the lower motor neurons at the anterior horn of the spinal cord. The lower motor neurons will then target the skeletal muscles responsible for movement of that body part involved. So in this scenario, it is the muscles involved in the right thumb movement. Majority of upper motor neurons are contained, as mentioned, in the lateral corticospinal tract. However, there are those that project to the proximal muscles, um, and these have axons that do not cross over at the medulla, but actually travel in the anterior corticospinal tract in the spinal cord. Axons of the anterior corticospinal tract will cross over when they reach the level of the spinal cord, where they will form synapses with the lower motor neurons. Hope that all made sense. Now it's important to realize two things here. The first is the general rule in which motor neurons activated on one side of the brain will control movement of the opposite side of the body. Second thing to remember is that the spinal motor tracts we discussed are under voluntary control. There is another motor tract which is also under voluntary control called the rubrospinal tract. Now the rubrospinal tract originates in the red nucleus of the midbrain. It decussates and then descends in the lateral aspect of the spinal cord where it will synapse with a lower motor neuron. The rubrospinal tract targets lower motor neurons, which facilitates in muscle flexion and inhibits neurons in muscle extension. Now, in summary, the upper motor neuron transmits information from the brain to the spinal cord or the brainstem. Lower motor neurons transmit information from the brainstem or spinal cord to the skeletal muscles. Clinical findings on examination can indicate whether a motor disorder is due to an upper or a lower motor neuron lesion. However, before going into the clinical examination, let's look at some causes of upper and lower motor neuron lesions. 
beginning with the upper motor neurons. Remember, the upper motor neuron transmits information from the brain to the spinal cord or the brainstem. So really, any injury to the brain, such as a stroke, infection, or tumors, can cause upper motor neuron lesions. Similarly, any injury to the brainstem or spinal cord, specifically the white matter of the spinal cord on the outside here, where the upper motor neurons are traveling through, can cause upper motor neuron lesions. Lower motor neurons are the neurons which transmit signals from the spinal cord or brainstem to the skeletal muscle. Lower motor neuron lesions are caused by any damage along this tract. So for example, injury to the axons leaving the spinal cord can cause lower motor neuron lesions. Injury to the spinal cord itself as well, particularly to the ventral gray matter of the spinal cord, the anterior horn of the spinal cord, because this is where the lower motor neurons start. It's quite amazing because through doing a proper neurological examination, you can sort of figure out whether a motor disorder is due to an upper or lower motor neuron lesion. Let's look at some of these signs on examination, beginning with upper motor neuron lesion signs. Again, the signs elicited on examination, of course, depends on what area of the motor pathway is, is affected, which side of the brain, the specific spinal cord level affected. But we won't go into that detail, just remember these overall signs. With upper motor neuron lesions, you would have minimal muscle atrophy. You would have weakness as the other neurons from other areas can sort of help with muscle movement still. When you test the deep tendon reflexes, such as the patellar reflex here, you would be hyperreflexic. The reason is a bit complicated, but essentially with a deep tendon reflex, where the spinal level is unaffected, the reflex is amplified because there are no upper motor neurons which are regulating the reflex at that level. However, in upper motor neuron lesions, there is diminished or absent superficial reflex. The Babinski sign is positive, where if you scrape the sole of the foot, what will happen is dorsiflexion and fanning of the toes. With lower motor neurons, there is muscle atrophy because the actual neurons which supply the muscles are not getting there. Flaccid paralysis is present. Normal or no plantar response because no signal are arriving at the muscles. Similarly, there is absent tendon reflexes. You can also see fasciculations of the affected muscle. This is where single muscle fibers are still stimulated. The reason for this is because there's still some transmission, some signals from lower motor neurons uh, which are not fully injured. So that was the overview for upper and lower motor neuron lesions. Motor disorders or deficits can also arise from other problems. For example, uh, disorders or problems of the skeletal muscle specifically. An example of this includes necrotizing myopathies or electrolyte changes such as hyperkalemia or hypokalemia. Motor disorders can also arise from neuromuscular junction disorders. The neuromuscular junction is where the lower motor neurons will release chemicals which will stimulate the muscle fibers. Example of neuromuscular junction disorders include myasthenia gravis, botulism, and aminoglycoside toxicity. If you want to learn more about the pyramidal system or other neurology topics, check out the playlist or visit armandoh.org.